Hello, everyone, and welcome in to CrushTheStreet.com. I'm Kenneth Amaduri, and we're joined today once again with Eric Voorhees of Shapeshift. Uh, some pretty interesting news coming from Shapeshift uh, to decentralize the entire company. So really exciting, and congratulations to him and uh, the leadership and, and everyone part of, of Shapeshift. Eric, of course, is someone who's paved the way for the build out the infrastructure of uh, Bitcoin and the crypto community as a whole. And it's a, it's a good time to be speaking with him. I mean, we've just gone below the $30,000 threshold uh, for Bitcoin. And I know we were at, we were at the $30,000 range essentially the entire summer. And so a lot of people were getting comfortable with the price. Maybe this is bottoming out here. Time to really uh, going hard with this bottoming. And then of course, you know, uh, the floor falls out. Now we're, we're still pretty close to 30, to be fair. We haven't gone to 25 in a hurry, but uh, you know, it's psychological. It's, it's uh, something we're going to talk about. So the last time Eric was on the show was February, a lot different time in the crypto community. Bitcoin was only going up and uh, you know, it was the Elon Musk news and we were talking about Tesla's and, and Dogecoin on the moon and things like that. So, um, Eric, uh, thanks so much for coming on the show. Quite a bit to talk about, and uh, you know, a lot of people have questions about the the future of crypto, and I'd love to get your thoughts on that here. But first of all, thanks so much for coming back. Yeah, happy to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, let's just start off general. You know, as I said in the introduction, there, Bitcoin thirty thousand. We were there in essentially the entire summer. And then, uh, you know, gravity took over and here we are below, below 30. Is that just the nature of, of bear markets? And, you know, I, I want to talk about the flow of financial capital. I, I gave you a little bit of a background as to what uh, I kind of want to get into in this interview here. But just on a general level, what are your thoughts on this $30,000 level and what we've seen throughout the summer? Yeah, well, 30 sucks, you know, when you're coming from 40 and 50. 30 was awesome when we were coming from 20, uh, and it's the same price. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's certainly kind of been like a dismal summer, and everyone was really enjoying the rally for a few months. Um, it's, it felt very short-lived. Uh, I'm, I'm of the camp that the, the full bull cycle has not played out yet, and that this is like a a pause, a significant one, admittedly. You know, this is certainly like a, a huge downturn from where we were at 60K. Um, but I've been through a number of these cycles and markets are very good at making fools of people. They're very good at destroying your predictions uh, no matter how close you are to the markets. And, um, you know, really the lesson of Bitcoin has been to look at the long view. And the more you can do that, the better. But it's easy, easier said than done. Absolutely. Yeah, there, there's no crystal ball. I mean, I've been buying here at the low 30s. And then, you know, it kind of does suck to watch it, you know, continue to fall. But if you want to uh, acquire more, you know, you want more sats, um, you know, you need to it's you can get more with, uh, you know, $10 than you could before, you know what I mean? Like, so that's, that's the positive, yeah. and something to it's uh, something to keep in mind. Now, I want to talk to you about the flow of capital. Uh, one of the things that we've seen with Bitcoin going to the trillion dollar market cap level is, is big money whales entering the space. Elon Musk putting $1.5 billion uh, into Bitcoin. You have Kathy Woods of ARK, you know, her $500,000 price prediction, uh, Michael Saylor saying we're going to a hundred trillion dollars of market cap. So just uh, another level of, uh, of investment demand coming into the space that we would have never seen had Bitcoin stuck around the $10,000 range. So maybe at the $10,000 range, you know, a crash went to 3000 and that was the floor. But now that we have all this new money, all this new capital, does that suggest a higher floor that you know, maybe it's twenty, maybe it's twenty-five. That we'll we won't go below because we have these this new flow of capital that's come into the space that created new new support. I think it's not ever good to assume there's a floor in any price of anything. Um, you know, financial markets will move in the direction that the markets take them. Certainly, the makeup of today's Bitcoin market is different than it was a year or two ago. Um, and is 
markedly better in terms of the liquidity and size of this market. So it's been a good, it's been a good direction. Um, you know, in general, Bitcoin will grow and stabilize as it achieves larger and larger circles of usage and holders. And we finally now have, you know, real institutions getting involved and just kind of the tip of that iceberg has started. So I think a lot of those, a lot of those holders probably have very different behaviors and tendencies than the average retail investor that's buying $500 of Bitcoin on Coinbase. They are probably slower to act in both directions, probably slower to buy on the upside and slower to sell, you know, when, when there's a daily crash or a weekly crash or something like that. Um, but, you know, I think it, no one should assume there's a floor in anything, right? If, if the world doesn't like Bitcoin, the price will, will head towards zero indefinitely. And what keeps it up isn't a floor. It's the fact that it is a monetary system that the entire world can use and there is nothing better than it. Um, that utility is really uh, what has the value, not, not some kind of superficial floor due to new buyers. Yeah, understood. So we've seen the hash rate come down to early 2020 levels, 2019 levels. Uh, how significant is this? And why have we seen this happen uh, over the summer here? So, yeah, I'm not an expert on the mining industry. I mean, clearly the, the one fact that everyone is mostly aware of is, is that China cracked down on Bitcoin mining. And um, so you have this whole exodus of mining interests from China to elsewhere. And whether that means a Chinese firm just shutting down completely, or whether that means them shutting down to disassemble and reassemble elsewhere, which, you know, who, long, who knows how long that could take. Um, that was a huge dislocation in the, in the market for mining. What's significant is, of course, that it was like the largest mining difficulty drop in Bitcoin's history, I believe. And that Bitcoin pretty much kept chugging along without a hiccup. You know, like even in the face of such a dislocation, such a change in the structure of the producers of blocks, Bitcoin just keeps working. And, you know, all, all that happens is that, you know, for a few weeks, the block time is longer than normal. Um, it's, a, it's a great demonstration of the elegance of the system and the resiliency of it, that it can handle such a dislocation like that. And most people who aren't deep into this industry, you know, don't even realize that the mining uh, hash rate fell off so far. For those listeners who are somewhat new to this stuff, when the mining hash rate falls, the difficulty will adjust uh, back downwards, and then the blocks will start moving at the same, you know, 10 minute interval again. Um, it is one of the mechanisms in Bitcoin that uh, allows it to allows it to grow, expand, and shrink uh, in relationship to the market. Yeah. Yeah, I, I heard some news stories saying, and I, I live in Texas, so it's kind of uh, close to home for me, but a lot of these miners may be moving to, to Texas uh, for you know energy uh, and the cost of energy. And that, that's interesting because I believe the energy in China was pretty pretty low. I heard the... Uh, and I, I haven't followed the stories too much on that, but I, I wonder what the significance of that will be on the cost of production, if you will, uh, for, for, for mining and, and new, new Bitcoin. And does that create a factor that may be bullish for, for Bitcoin longer term? Yeah, I don't think the cost of mining um, has anything to do with the price. It, it follows the price. It does not lead the price. Uh, you know, in part because of this difficulty adjustment. Um, no matter what the cost of it is, you can sell a Bitcoin for what other people want to buy it for. And um, the cost of the mining being higher, uh, all that means is that miners are less profitable. And so at the margin, some will drop out. What that means is the difficulty adjustment will reset and it'll get easier again. So all that can happen without the price doing uh, anything. Interesting. Yeah. It's like the reverse though, of how a housing market necessarily, you know, would potentially work. Cause if you have a house that costs $150,000 to build, you know, the, the builder isn't going to want to sell it for anything less than that, but it's possible. I mean, there's markets that just don't sustain uh, $150,000 houses and you have to sell it for $125,000. Yeah, the, the major difference is that Bitcoin is really like the only asset where when price rises, production cannot 
you cannot produce more Bitcoin when the price rises um, and you will not produce fewer Bitcoin when the price falls. The production rate stays constant, which is you know fascinating and is unlike any other market. You know, in, in housing, if the price rises, production of houses can actually increase and vice versa. Yeah, that's that's good. So any and um, anything significant on the technical levels uh, that you would point us towards? Uh, you know, as far as upward movements in Bitcoin, downward movements. I mean, does this thirty thousand dollar threshold make you nervous? That hey, now that we've gone below, the floor may fall out in a hurry to twenty six or twenty five. Uh, I'm not a big technical guy, but I think there's some things psychological. There's something self fulfilling about the technicals that people do watch. Sure. Yeah, I don't. I don't pay too much attention to that, other than you know, I I watch the price all day. And um, like it when it goes up, and I'm sad when it goes down. So <laughs> certainly going below 30 was was a bummer. Uh, but you know, as as my wife told me last night, she's like, you know, all I do is look at the price a year ago of Bitcoin, and um, it's hard to do that and not be extremely excited about where we are. That's a good that's a good antidote to anyone who is concerned about you know any day to day price movements. Like just look at Bitcoin a year ago two years ago and and you it it forces your mind to look more at the long term of the stuff which is always always more important yeah. there have been so many so many massive crashes and drawdowns in the bitcoin price in its history so many of them they are they are regular they are normal um so for those people who are who are just feeling their first like drops because they bought it at 50k um just don't worry about it you know <laughs> ignore it for six months and and check in then yeah. Yeah. E easier said than done, of course. And you know, Definitely. what's interesting is um, what's difficult about the Bitcoin situation, at least for me to, to wrap my mind around is, you know, when it was much early stage, much more early stage, the a small amount of capital flowing into it can cause it to go higher. But now that we're at these higher levels, it takes more capital and more positive news. And I'm wondering if we're getting to a a point where maybe the news is getting saturated and, and it might be harder to maintain a $50,000 price Bitcoin or $75,000 price Bitcoin if you have dead weight on it, like, uh, you know, governments cracking down like China or you have uh, governments cracking down because they say it's not uh, environmentally friendly. It's just consuming too much power. And so I'm wondering if we do get to a saturated point where we do need some more mainstream adoption for it to go to the next level. I wonder if you believe that or, or is that a concern for you? The way I think about it is that Bitcoin is on this long-term ascent to taking over global monetary dominance. It's been on this ascent for 12 years. It will be on this ascent for another 12 years. And that process is fairly organic and and somewhat smooth, like the, the number of people interested in, in holding it. And then around that, you get this speculative price, which is constantly overshooting and undershooting in both directions. Um, and, and that's kind of inevitable, right? Like you can't have an asset that just smoothly or linearly increased by five or 10% per month as the adoption of it grows, because you would get you know, the best performing asset ever. And people would start front running that and you'll turn that into a speculative bubble that has to pop. And then you get a, you know, a downturn in a bear market. So it's like an inevitable pattern that develops when you have an asset that just slowly grows in adoption, you know, from one person out to 8 billion over a few decades. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's a good way to look at it. And it also puts it into perspective you know, what you're quote unquote risking when you do buy into Bitcoin at these levels and, and watch it move down 10%, you know, in a couple of days. I mean, I, like I said, I, I've been buying this week, you know, I bought as high as $33,000 just a few days ago. And, uh, you know, here we are, here we are down about 10%, you know, a little over 10% from that. So, you know, it's always hard to, uh, it's always hard to watch that happen. But if you have a long-term view on that, you know, it's uh, it, it uh, puts it all into perspective. So, Eric, let's talk a little bit about uh, shapeshift decentralizing. I mean, I asked you before the interview here, was that 
a, a win for the company? Was it a win for the crypto community? Is it, you know, is that difficult to do? I mean, you know, how was this implemented? I mean, this is something that I know crypto investors, at least the traditional ones, maybe not so much the new mainstream ones, are very, very interested in. You know, people that want uh, autonomy, they want freedom, they want to be able to trust the system, you know, because they don't trust people, <laughs> any one person. Yep. So anyways, uh, yeah, let's talk about this. This is pretty exciting. Yeah. Uh, well, last week we announced that Shapeshift is decentralizing. And I want to stress that this is the start of that process. It's not like we completed it and we are today decentralized. Today, we are still a centralized company and are in a process of decentralizing. So what does that mean? That means um, we are changing our structure from being a corporate entity that is based around you know, shareholders and a board and an executive team and W2 employees to an organization that has an open source product that is based around our Fox token as the governance and economic asset instead of shares. That means that there is going to be no corporate entity anymore after we unwind it completely. That means that there is going to be no W2 employees after we unwind it completely. There are going to be no business contracts that the entity has with, with other vendors. It is purely moving into this open source platform that anyone in the world can contribute to and it is governed and managed by the community of Fox token holders. So transitioning from that centralized entity into that decentralized form um, is absolutely a huge challenge. It's kind of, it kind of hasn't been done before by a centralized entity that has been around for seven years and has you know like traditional shareholders and VCs and all that. So we're charting some new territory here. It's gonna take us months to do it. It's gonna be iterative. And um, we're just going to see how far we can take it. But yeah, ultimately, it will mean that Shapeshift AG, this, the Swiss holding corp, will be gone. And Shapeshift itself will just be this open source software platform. Yeah. That's awesome. That, that's really cool. And I, and I think that resonates well with uh, the, the crypto community. And uh, that's always an interesting thing, by the way, the dynamic of how crypto started and bridging that gap, because there's so many, you know, um, what are they anarchists, libertarian type minded people in the crypto community. And, and we got to get along with the, the, you know, mainstream, uh, progressive world. And, uh, it seems like a weird marriage. And that's another thing that kind of makes me nervous about the future of crypto or like, again, maybe not the ner uh, nervous, but the dead weight, I should say of acceptance, uh, with the mainstream is that you have this, um, uh, I guess this polarizing um, sets of communities, these communities that may not otherwise get along, but uh, you know, here we are and it is growing and, and it's a beautiful thing to see. So I'll let you respond to that. And I, I do wanna ask you about Ethereum here. Sure. Um, yeah, I think like with Bitcoin, with crypto generally, you have these systems which are immutable and, and open and cannot be controlled by any person, company, institution. And then you have society and you have all these institutions which exist purely to control how money works and purely to surveil people's usage of it. And so these two systems are in this like massive struggle, a system which cannot be controlled with institutions which exist to control. Um, and then there are a whole bunch of these crypto people and companies caught in the middle of that conflict. So Shapeshift's decision here uh, is done in large part to align Shapeshift more with that openness, that borderlessness, that immutability of these protocols and to not have the liability and the terrestrial friction of being a corporation and having you know, a central leader, you know, I will no longer be CEO of Shapeshift. I will just be one member in the community contributing as and when I wish. Um, and it's a totally new paradigm and structure for an organization to form around. So um, yeah, we're, we're happy to experiment with this and to see how, how far we can take it. Yeah. Yeah. Crypto doesn't have a religion. There is no polit political view. It's, uh, it's like the truth is the the truth, no matter what we, we think of it, you know, it's not benign or malignant. It's just the truth. And so 
uh, that's the, even though it was started by maybe people that are, you know, have a political leaning or just some sort of uh, view of the world and, and distrust of the government in a way it's, um, it's, it is, it just stands on its own. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your, what you may believe or your polit politics are, which, uh, yeah, and, I think that's really cool about it. And crucially so, it's, it's all voluntary. Absolutely. The whole system is voluntary. It is something where if you don't care about it, you don't have to use it ever in any way. If you think it's stupid, it is no burden on you. But for those who are interested in it, it is this open system and an unlimited tapestry on which people can be creative with economic design. And I, I think that's so, so exciting and, and fulfilling to be part of that. So true. So true. All right, Eric, let's talk about Ethereum. You know, it's interesting when Bitcoin was fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, Ethereum was seventeen or $1,800. And, uh, you know, it seemed to lag Bitcoin's move uh, higher. You know, it, it's, it's kind of like how they say silver, uh, you know, goes, takes a little longer, but goes further than gold when gold moves. But I think we're seeing that with, with Ethereum as well. But here we are, Bitcoin is, you know, crashed, but uh, if you look at it in terms of like a timeline, when Bitcoin peaked, Ethereum is basically where it was at when Bitcoin peaked. So if you would have sold Bitcoin at the peak, you know, and kept your Ethereum, you know, you were in better shape than had you sold your Ethereum and, and uh, kept your Bitcoin. Uh, so anyways, just your thoughts here with what we're seeing in Ethereum, you know, the build out on that. I know a lot of people... Uh, buy it as the the silver to Bitcoin's gold, and you know, uh, you know, obviously for much more reasons than that. But in general, what are your thoughts here? I'm super bullish on Bitcoin and super bullish on Ethereum. Um, own both. Wish I had more of both. They are valuable and interesting for different reasons. They obviously have some overlap, but they're very different assets. The amount of financial innovation that's happening within the Ethereum ecosystem is shocking and overwhelming. And um, I don't know how you can play around with those systems, try them out and not see like how, how cool this stuff is getting. Uh, Bitcoin is, Bitcoin is valuable in part because it doesn't do much, right? It is so conservative and so, um, so solid, you know what it will be tomorrow. Ethereum is so cool because you don't really know what it will be tomorrow. Although you know that there are like tens of thousands of talented engineers building in that ecosystem with like some of the most radical financial technology ever created. So these two things are amazing assets in that, in that polarity, in that juxtaposition. Um, obviously in Ethereum's case, this uh, 1559 uh, that's coming up is the biggest sort of quote unquote macro event, you know, for, for Ethereum. Uh, I believe that activates in August. Um, and that's, you know, yet another milestone on the way to uh, ETH 2.0. So that'll be, that'll be a big deal. When that, when that occurs, um, Ethereum will actually be burning some portion of the new supply and its inflation rate will actually uh, decline below Bitcoins. So that's kind of an interesting phenomena. Um, it will actually have a lower inflation rate than Bitcoin. Both of both of their inflation rates are pretty low um, and falling over time. But um, yeah, that's a that's an important fact and event to watch. Absolutely. Well, Eric, uh, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. If people want to learn more about you, learn more about Shapeshift, uh, uh, please let everyone know where they can go and what they can expect to find. Yeah, I, I guess I need to remind everyone that Shapeshift did an airdrop of these tokens to over a million people. So if you have ever used Shapeshift in the past with a ETH or ERC20 address, um, or if you're a member of a number of different DeFi communities, we airdrop to about 1.1 million uh, different addresses. So go to shapeshift.com, see if you're eligible there. Um, the average you know, airdrop amount is like a couple hundred dollars. So um, it's worth your time to check. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Eric Voorhees. And um, yeah, that, that's it. Eric, really appreciate your time. Thanks for your insight. I mean, uh, it, was a, it was an important 
time in uh, Bitcoin's moment in history here, uh, I think, to uh, update people and to discuss the markets, especially the emotions of this roller coaster, and to put it into perspective that we are on this ascending uptrend, as you put it. In fact, I might have that in the, the title of this, this interview here today. So again, thanks so much for coming on the show with me today. Happy to be here. Thank you.